So we really appreciate um, your questions. They help us uh, and they also help us build a better product. So we're really excited to get started. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about with you is stress. <laughs> so right now, uh, I think all of us kind of get that stress is a bigger deal, right? We all really understand what's going on <coughs> right now. Um, but that said, sometimes there are symptoms of stress that we might not always see as stress. And I think what's really interesting uh, about where we are in science is that a lot of these things that we used to describe are now understandable on a measurable level and they're we can see what's going on in our physiology when stress happens and use that information to help us understand you know really what's going on in our bodies and likewise now we are starting to really understand the science behind recovery and resilience and how we can actually bounce back and adapt to stress because i think when we say reduce stress, what does that really mean? Are we really reducing stress? We're not getting rid of these things that are outside of ourselves that we can't necessarily control. It's really about what we can do and what's based in science that we know we can do to actually make it so that we can bounce back, be resilient, and have more control over how we feel, our focus, our sleep, and a lot of these things that we need to do to be healthy but are challenging to do when we're stressed out. So I was hoping we could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. I think that's a lot of the questions that I'm personally getting lately from my clients and um, from pretty much everyone I talk to. I think that, um, you know, one of the common misunderstandings about stress, and this is something that is not unique to, to you know, the general audience or people who might be listening here, but I think this actually goes all the way back to the way that we're taught this in medical school, which is part of why doctors are not necessarily, the, you know, so always so great at explaining this to our to our clients. And it's that, you know, we actually have a lot more control, as Catherine was saying, about how we bounce back from stress. Uh, and what we've learned through an enormous amount of incredible literature, and I'm going to try to do my best to sum up about 50 years of uh, neuroscience for you in the next hour or half hour. Um, and I think, uh, and these are the most important points that I took from uh, realizing what they were not teaching us very well in medical school about the nervous system and the way the nervous system balances itself in response to stress, but also that when we need to respond to stress reliably in a consistent, high-performance way, uh, whether that's physical, mental, or emotional, the body doesn't really know the difference. And that was a really fantastic publication by Tor Wager that came out of um, the University of Pittsburgh in collaboration with a number of other great universities, uh, scientists that showed that um, stress and pain in our brains actually doesn't look that different, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. We can't really tell the difference, which is really interesting. Um, and so when we think about that, um, that really helps us understand a lot about um, the way that our bodies cope with stress from studies on people like elite athletes. Um, elite athletes are really incredible specimens of humanity because they work extraordinarily hard to always peak perform. Uh, in the moment, in whatever it is that's coming at them for a physical performance event, they always need to be at their highest level so that they can compete at that level and compete against the other people that uh, they're up against. And a, lot and of this, a lot of this research actually about resilience is something that, I mean, in medical school, they just teach you that the autonomic nervous system kind of works in the background, right? right? They don't necessarily talk to you about how to train it. And I think what's really interesting from... Uh, you know, from elite athletes is, you know, an elite athlete might have to ride all the way up a big mountain, but then when they come home, they really focus on recovery, mm -hmm. right? And they focus on recovery so that the next day their legs or whatever it is they're doing is they're in good shape to be able to do it again, because if they're not, then what was the point in the first place? They can't build up their training. Exactly. And I think that, and, and that's, that's the, a, a perfect way to understand it because I think one of the things that we are often not taught, not just in medical school, but also in our general day-to-day -day lives and, and about um, the way that we get the most out of ourselves is that we have to focus on peak recovery as much as we focus on peak performance. And there are very, very well-known ways now that are backed up by neuroscience that we'll get into that um, explain how to achieve peak recovery state so that when we are not stressed out, or when we are not threatened by a survival threat, or we're not in a, a tense physical performance state, 
we can rapidly calm down and rapidly boost our energy recovery, our energy restoration, our reproductive system, digestive system, creativity, immunity, um, and all the things that help restore our body so that we can perform at our highest level whenever the next opportunity arises. Right, and we talk a lot about you know, nervous system, what's going on in the nervous system and building up you know, the balance of the nervous system. And so I was wondering, you know, what does that mean? How is stress causing an imbalance in our nervous system? And what does that mean for our health? Because when we talk about an athlete, it's really simple to understand, right? Like an athlete, they have to use all of their muscles and go up that hill or, or be in that fight or play in that game or run. And they have a physical thing they have to do, which is a strain. And then they have to recover, right? They ice bath, they sleep they uh, might stretch, they do these restorative things so that their body can recoup. But when we think about mental health, how do we take what we've learned about resilience training from people like elite athletes, people in the military, and how do we apply that to mental health? Like what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really where the biggest gap lies. And it's not just mental health, it's also emotional health um, that we often forget about, which is interpreted in a very similar way by the body in that there are very specific strategies um, that we can tap into that reliably help us rebalance our nervous system to enter a peak recovery state more effectively. And I think one of the things that's really incredible about where we are in neuroscience today that we often don't talk about enough is that for decades, we have been trying to figure out an objective biomarker of stress in the body. Um, what that means is, is there a way like blood, blood pressure or like heart rate where there's a number that we can use Used to represent how stressed our body is and, or how balanced our nervous system is in response to stress. How likely are we to recover and bounce back? Um, and over the last 30 to 50 years or so, one of the markers that has really come to the surface is heart rate variability, um, which has the, become the most reliable way to measure and track recovery and also to measure and track the effects of stress on us in the short term, but also in the long term. And um, we'll make a whole list of large list of references, uh, literature references that we have identified from an enormous amount of research for you. So you don't have to do it yourself um, after this. Um, but if you want to share that. Yeah, you had some slides about the balance of the nervous system that I think are a good primer. Um, so let's so, go through those. So I think that we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, but I think the first step is just to remember that when we're stressed out, we often feel like this guy. Yeah, here. I've been this guy. Uh, we've all been in this situation, <laughs> and that could be because we're overwhelmed with too many things to do at work, or you know, annoying emails, or traffic, or our kids screaming in the background, or whatever it might be, just too much responsibility, right. too much uncertainty, and feeling out of control. And I think that's a really good primer. So when you think about stress from, uh, you know, from an athletic perspective, that's easy, right? You're doing a strain, you're straining the muscles, then the muscles regrow when they recover and then they get stronger. Um, when you think about Tim or any of us who have felt overwhelmed, I think, you know, when you're looking at stress outside yourself, sometimes it manifests in ways that you don't necessarily think of as stress. And so what are some of those ways that it manifests and how is that connected in with the nervous system? So I think what's really interesting about the way that stress manifests is we don't necessarily detect the early signs, not because we are, you know, you know, not good at it. We just don't practice it or we don't pay attention to it. We haven't been taught what the early signs are. Um, the earliest signs of stress that we typically will can detect are decreases in creativity, um, decreases in irritability and attention, or sorry, increases in irritability, more being more sort of on edge. Moody. Moody. Um, and also not being able to focus for extended periods of time on things. And these are the most common things that happen because we need to feel safe to be able to engage those parts of our brain fully. Um, as you can see in the middle of this slide, that when we're stressed out, it overactivates our fear center in the amygdala and disrupts the activity in the emotional cortex, which helps us to establish a sense of safety and activates the parasympathetic or rest and digest recovery nervous system. So when we are chronically stressed out, um, the first things that happen is activity gets diverted away from the recovery system into the fear and the uh, fear response system and into the, the muscles, the heart, the motor cortex of the brain, all the things that are responsible for what we think about as fight or flight or the freeze response. And so the first things that we notice typically when we're paying attention to these things are poor focus, poor mood, irritability, 
And, um, and then what we see next is restlessness. And this can be something that typically we notice very commonly, but sometimes we ignore it and we take that restlessness and we go do something with it. Like we go exercise or, um, you know, stretch or do yoga. And sometimes we take it out on our friends and family without realizing it. Or we do things that are maybe <laughs> not as constructive, right? So like right. we might scroll on Instagram or Facebook to or, distract ourselves or watch, from... you know, mindless things on TV that right. we don't even want to watch. We should be going to bed. And some of those things are distracting us from the things around us. So I think when you look at Tim, Tim's overwhelmed, right? Tim's looking at his computer and there's too many things that he needs to do and maybe he's under a deadline and he's very stressed, but there's things that are outside of his control, right? There may be too many things for him to process and focus on. And so he feels overwhelmed, but that's actually something that's going on in his body. Right. And I think what's really interesting about where we are in science is that we're starting to understand these symptoms that are, were always kind of described in a really subjective way. And we're starting to understand what's actually going on physiologically. Right. And so the physiology of this is actually a lot more simple than I think I was originally taught personally. And so we created this uh, way to explain this to people more easily, which is that the fight or flight system, the sympathetic stress response system that is overactivated in Tim and in many of us that you know, as we see from the statistics, particularly during this very uncertain time, we see increases in um, the use of medications, increases in the use of things like alcohol and different recreational substances, cannabis, and we also see increases in really unfortunate behaviors like domestic abuse. And all of these things are happening because our stress response system is constantly increased, which results in increases in our heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, physical and mental restlessness, decreases in sleep, and also decreases in creativity, focus, energy, and recovery. And so all of these things start to happen and we want them to happen when we're running from a lion or a saber tooth tiger, or there's an immediate threat like starvation or a flood or something terrible that we really need to escape from or to fight off. But that is not what's usually ha happening in our moment to moment and day to day of our lives. Um, it's more of an existential threat. It's a perceived threat. And, but the body, our bodies don't know the difference. Our fear center of our brain doesn't know the difference unless we train it. And the reason why that's so important is because Apollo and what a lot of the techniques that we talk about are based on this understanding of the nervous system that's actually not unique to Western medicine. It's something that, we've, that has been understood by Eastern medicine practitioners for thousands of years um, and also by people who have done yoga, music therapy, massage, biofeedback, breath work. All of these things tap into this system. And the reason why it's so important to understand is because when we are in a threatening survival state, we don't want to fall asleep with a bear outside our tent or a threat outside of our cave. We don't want our bodies to allow us to get into that vulnerable state when there could be a threat. But if that threat is actually an email or that threat is traffic, then you don't want all of these things to happen that result in us making poor decisions, losing our focus, losing our creativity, feeling tired all the time. It impairs everything that we want out of thriving in our lives. And so we can measure that as low heart rate variability, as you can see here. And that disrupts our general balance and equilibrium. Um, what's important to note is that the sympathetic fight or flight system is triggered by threat, perceived or real. It's triggered by the, right. the, the it's triggered by fear. And so we can balance that out by doing activities that boost our parasympathetic system on the left side, which is triggered by safety stimuli, safety things in our lives, soothing, gentle music, soothing touch, breath. And why do these things work? Well, they work because when we take a deep breath and we start to feel and be conscious or aware of the feeling of the breath coming into our nose or our mouth and into our bodies, even in that split second, our brains, that emotional cortex we were, and the fear center we were talking about earlier, gets an immediate signal, totally subconscious, but an immediate signal that reminds us that if we have time to pay attention to our breath in this moment or to pay attention to the feeling of touch from a loved one in this moment, then we are clearly not running from a lion. Because if we were running from a lion, then we would not have the time to stop and pay attention to somebody, the feeling of how good it feels to take a nice deep breath or the feeling of somebody you love holding your hand or giving you a hug, or the feeling of Apollo. Um, so all of this system actually exists and goes back probably over 300 million years, and it was discovered by 
in large part, and the importance of it, I should say, was discovered by Eric Kandel, who won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for discovering the origins of learning and memory. Um, and so what he showed is as we train these systems over time, that we can actually train our bodies to enter a more balanced state that favors recovery and favors bouncing back from stress and responding to stress in a better, more adaptive way that is not only helpful to us in the short term, but also helpful to us in the long term. And you can see that in some of these boxes up here talking about when you practice increasing recovery in parasympathetic activity, you see decreases in heart rate, decreases in blood pressure, respiratory rate, physical and mental restlessness and anxiety, but also increased focus, creativity, energy, recovery, digestion, immunity, reproduction, all the important stuff that we really care about. So I think what's really interesting about this and, and what I'm hearing uh, is essentially when you are chronically stressed out, right, which means, you know, there's frequently things around you that are out of your control. Let's say when those can be mundane things, they don't have to be acute things. Right. Right. So that can be like, you know, to a very busy life, a busy schedule, uh, lots of uh, information coming at you constantly, pings, emails, notifications, um, or even things like, uh, you know, what we're dealing with right now, which is this pandemic completely changed how our lives are, and we don't have a lot of control over it, right? We only have control over certain things, but, you know, a lot of our lives have become disrupted. What I'm seeing here is that what that does to us is it puts us into this fear state, which is almost like a cycle, mm -hmm. right? And so what ends up happening is you have these effects physiologically, like you're starting to sweat and your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up. And that disrupts all of these things on the other side, like your sleep and your digestion. It literally just takes energy away from those things like digestion, immunity and sleep and recovery and reproduction because the body perceives that we don't need to give those things resources. Because we have to deal with a threat. We have to deal with an immediate threat. Right. And so when we're dealing with this threat, it's fine if that threat's a lion because that's an acute threat and then we can get away from the threat. Right. But when the threat is something that's persistent, the body doesn't have time to recover. And so I think what's really interesting that about this, when we talk about resilience training and training the nervous system, increasing parasympathetic tone, what we're really doing is building up our own capability to deal with stress. Because I think for a lot of people, when people are stressed, they lean into the stress because they want to solve the problem. They want to consume more news to learn more about the thing, or they want to dive into the problem at work. And what we often find, even throughout history, is you know when people take you know buoyancy was they discovered buoyancy because somebody took a break and went to got in a bathtub. Archimedes. Archimedes. Right. His right. wife forced him to take a take bath. Take a break. And on take the break, break, on the break in the bathtub <laughs> is when he actually discovered one of the most right. important discoveries of uh, of modern day science, which is buoyancy and and the principles yeah. of flotation. Yeah, and, and, Isaac, Isaac, and Isaac Newton has a great example. Right, Isaac Newton had to flee Cambridge because of the Black Plague and went from a work from home and discovered the theory of, of gravity, gravity motion. Most of calculus, <laughs> Western calculus. And so right. all of these breaks for recovery are critical, absolutely critical to reestablish balance or what we, what we call homeostasis in the body and balance between the mind and the body. Um, and I think the most important thing to take from Eric Kandel's contribution to this is that practice makes perfect and it's not unique to us. It goes all the way back to ancient sea snails that only have three neurons in their brains. When we practice being stressed out, as Catherine was saying earlier, we get really, really, really good at training our body to be in a stressed out, constantly hyper vigilant, um, always worried, always thinking active brain state high heart rate, high blood pressure, high respiration state. We which get never trained gives you a break. into that state, which never gives our bodies a break to actually settle down. Even if we think we're getting a break, we think we're taking a break to go in the hot tub or to go relax or do whatever it is. If we are constantly thinking and worried all the time and we're not psychologically allowing ourselves to enter into a recovery state, because you mentioned something I think that's really important earlier that we don't often admit is that especially people who are really hard working, especially, we are taught that breaks are indulgent and we are taught that taking a break means that we are giving, giving up and that we are letting go of something we should be just putting our nose down with the tunnel vision and sticking to um, 
until we collapse. And that it couldn't be further from the <laughs> it's truth. Terrible. It, it's probably the worst thing that we could possibly be teaching each other. And we actually see this now with the elite military. And there's been an enormous and amount physicians of, and physicians burnout. Yeah, the physician and healthcare worker burnout right now is actually a crisis that was announced by the WHO in 2019. And there's been huge initiatives to combat burnout um, with, a, you know, pioneered in large part by um, Dr. Freudenberger and Dr. Joe Maroon and a number of other experts in the field. Um, but also we see this in the military where the military is actually taking major strides right now to teach soldiers in basic training resilience techniques, techniques just like these that boost, and we'll talk about them now, things like meditation, mindfulness, and breath work, right? And I think this is where all of this comes back to center is that the most important thing to take home from this is we have control over this system. We were taught originally that it's just automatic. It happens, it works in the background and it does work in the background. But when we don't accept that we have control over the system with techniques like mindfulness and meditation and breath work or yoga and biofeedback and exercise and how much we prioritize those things in our lives, then we actually just admit that we're allowing the system to just be influenced by the environment and go on its own way. But we are forgetting that we actually have a say in how this system functions and how well it functions and how well it responds to the environment. And so by doing things like these ancient Eastern techniques like yoga and exercise or breath work, which in Western science is biofeedback, breath meditation, or massage, music, and touch, all of these techniques, the more we do them in the proper way, literally trains this balance to be mm -hmm. switched so that the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are more equal in activity, which is effectively like saying that we're training ourselves to be in a flow state or a peak recovery state as often as possible. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is when we get into the stress state and we practice being stressed, it isn't really your fault, right? A lot of people were like, oh, I can't sleep because I have racing thoughts or oh, I can't focus because I'm overwhelmed. And I think the real key takeaway from science is that there's actually something physiologically going on in your body that is causing you to have a harder time to pay attention or having a harder time going to sleep. And it's because your body is in this wired state, right? You are in this wired state. And so when we talk about practice, if you- Talking about practice? <laughs> when you take, when you're talking about practice, um, when you start to practice activities that are restorative, you actually are making it yourself more able to deal with the things at hand. And what we realize now is that, you know, there's some stressors that we're going to have to keep dealing with, right? There are things that happen in the environment outside ourselves, but if you uh, practice these restorative practices, then you can actually make yourself more resilient. And this is ex very important for all people, healthy people, busy people, but it's also important, um, especially for people who are suffering from any chronic illness, mm -hmm. because stress really exacerbates symptoms of chronic illness because it literally makes it more difficult for your normal um, systems to work, right? So it increases inflammation is the major thing. Right, it increases inflammation. It makes it harder cognitively to focus and can actually lead to cognitive impairment. Um, it disrupts sleep, which is extraordinarily important for restoration. And it also disrupts you know, cardiovascular health and digestive health. And so all, the whole myriad of chronic conditions, even things like diabetes are worsened by stress. Mm -hmm. And increasing parasympathetic tone actually helps to m diminish symptoms naturally. And so I think when you talk about you know, music and the science of like how we boost resilience, how are things, how does stuff like touch, which is really the basis of Apollo, and music, mm -hmm. which is really the base of Apollo, how do those things increase parasympathetic tone? Like how are you, what happens when you get a massage or when you listen to music or when you do yoga or when you do breath work? What's actually happening in the body? That's a great question. And I think that taps into, and, and thank you for summarizing that. I thought that was really great. I mean, and I think that touch and music and massage are really you know, a really important step to think about and talk about because touch doesn't have to be from another person. It, it, ideally it is from a loved one, but we actually it can have also a lot be of, from yourself. You can actually self touch. That is really helpful. Like putting pressure on your chest with your hand, even one hand can increase calm pretty rapidly. Touching the inside of the outside of your ear, inside of the lobe, um, all of these things activate vagal pathways in the body. And you'll see, if you look on the internet, there's lots of devices that try to tap into these specific spots on the body. Um, 
But I think what's really important about touch, just getting onto a very basic level, is that touch is the most evolutionarily conserved pathway for sending safety signals to the body, which allows this parasympathetic rest and digest recovery nervous system to turn on. Because when, as we were talking about earlier with breath, is that when we are touched and we have the time to think about the feeling of that touch from a loved one or from ourselves, it instantly sends a signal to our brains below our level of awareness most of the time, instantaneously sends a signal to the brain that says, I'm safe enough to take the time to pay attention to this feeling. So it interrupts the stress response. It just rapidly interrupts the stress response, which over, which doesn't necessarily have a long lasting effect, but as we, but from the moment we start to feel that breath and be aware of it, the moment we start to feel that touch and be aware of it, what that, that starts that cascade of increased recovery and through safety signals, which then oh, as we continue to pay attention to the touch or pay attention to the breath, it reinforces that just like running from something that we were previously thought we were afraid of reinforces the stress response. So it's literally just about understanding that we can retrain our nervous system in this way and we can also measure it in heart rate variability. The more we train our parasympathetic system and our recovery system, the higher our heart rate variability gets. Wait, wait, wait. So heart rate variability. What's heart rate variability oh, yeah. and why do we want it to be high? So heart rate variability is a measure of the way that our heartbeat changes in response to the environment. So this is a kind a, a, a relatively confusing measure um, to a lot of people. Well, it's but a little counterintuitive. We normally right. think we want a low heart rate. Which we do. And you don't, and a lot of people would say, why would I want my heart rate to be variable? So I guess heart rate variability is this key indicator of this exact balance, right? The balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Elite athletes in general have really high heart rate variability right. because they spend so much time boosting up their resilience. And by high, we're talking about somewhere between 100 and over 200 in some really excellent physical and uh, mental health cases, people who are really fine specimens, they're in the 100. Master meditators, right, elite over, athletes. Right, but people who are chronically ill or chronically stressed tend to be below 40 milliseconds of heart rate variability, which means that the difference in, in time between beat one and beat two only, only varies by, on average, 40 milliseconds. So that means typically if you have a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, we think of that as being one beat every second on the dot, but that's absolutely not what's happening. There's always a little bit of wiggle room in between the beats. Sometimes it's a tiny bit of wiggle room, which would mean low heart rate variability. And then other times it's a lot of wiggle room where sometimes it's gonna be 1.2 seconds between beat one and beat two, and then between beat two and beat three, it's 0.8 seconds, and then it changes. And the more changing that we see between the beats in terms of time, the more, that correlates with resilience, recovery, performance, consistent performance, and also the functioning of our immune system and our ability to recover from physical, mental, and emotional stress. So why is that important, particularly right now, is because if we practice techniques that boost our heart rate variability, it actually increases our ability to recover from illness and it decreases the likelihood that we will get sick. So this is really, really important because low because and, and i think most of the studies have been done on people with low heart rate variability and if you have which is corresponds with a high activity in the sympathetic fight or flight nervous system and again we'll make all these uh, references available to you um but as we have a higher sympathetic activity a higher heart rate higher blood pressure higher respiratory rate over time our heart rate variability goes down and the lower our heart rate variability the greater our likelihood of getting sick the greater our likelihood of getting injured during athletic performance or any stressful activity, the greater our likelihood of making mistakes during decisions, and the greater our likelihood of actually dying should we get sick with a very, you know, so what difficult we're illness that compromises saying here us. Is that you want your heart rate to be variable? You want high heart rate variability because it means that you're adaptive and able to respond. Right. So the able reason, to bounce back. So the pe reason people who are chronically stressed out or may have a chronic illness that causes there to be more sympathetic activity in the body, have a lower threshold, right, for res lower threshold for stress, have lower resilience to stress, is because their parasympathetic nervous system isn't engaged, they don't have enough recovery such that they can respond. Right. So when we're talking about Apollo, right, we all understand, we've all heard about yoga, we all intuitively know for most of us that some form of massage 
or a touch from a loved one is generally calming. We know that when we take a deep breath, it calms us down. And now we know, thanks to you, that when you do this deep breathing or have this touch, it signals safety to the brain and then the body starts to regulate itself, right? So that it interrupts this fear response, it interrupts the stress response and gives the body time to recover. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is that Apollo is this kind of new form of touch therapy and that it increases HRV, right? right? It increases heart rate variability and it increases recovery. And there's these things that happen that allow you to focus better or sleep better. But how does this actually work? How do the modes, how do the Apollo vibrations actually affect the nervous system to get those outcomes? What's happening? And how does that train the nervous system over time? So what we figured out from the lab work at the University of Pittsburgh, which was originally done um, through a lot of experimentation, started out with our you know small groups of subjects and pilots, and then and on ourselves at our lab you know lab team, and then expanded out into double-blind randomized placebo-controlled crossover study, which is the most rigorous form of clinical trial. We did this in healthy subjects, and we found that. Um, Basically, after analyzing all the literature that we will, many, much of which we can share with you, and it's already actually on the website, you can find it uh, on apolloneuro.com, um, we found that through especially the meditation literature, the massage literature, the athletic literature, and the biofeedback literature, that there are very specific frequencies that the body enters when we enter a meditative state or a recovery state that directly results in people saying, I feel better. And these states are all consistent with high heart rate variability states, or what we call increases in the vagus nerve tone, um, which is the system that is the major nerve that's, that's involved in the parasympathetic rest and recovery pathway. Um, and so why is this important? Because if things like, because with my clients and my patients who I work with, people with severe PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, substance use disorders, they are always in this hyper sympathetic, hyper fight or flight state. And what they actually say is, I never feel safe, except at times when I'm like with you, doctor, in the office, and we're having a really nice conversation. And I feel like I can bring up a lot of these things that happen to me that I don't feel comfortable talking about with anybody else. Why is that? And so it really got me thinking about, you know, if I can make these people feel safe in the office, and things like soothing touch, massage, music, all of these meditation, breath work, all of these things can help people feel safe and they, and they are, can be measured as an increase in heart rate variability. And people with PTSD, depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders, chronic pain, insomnia, they all have low, low heart rate variability. Then what if we could figure out the patterns of touch, biofeedback, and meditation that, that we're seeing in people and then effectively describe them with math and then create these frequencies, rhythms that we could deliver to the skin instead of the ears as like music, basically music that we compose based on the neuroscience of touch and the, neuro and the neuroscience of how music frequencies affect the body that are composed specifically for your skin as the listening organ instead of your ear. So you don't have to have something in your ears all the time, but you can still get the same benefit. And I think music is where we really know that frequency, we have the most experience with frequency affecting us and changing the way that we feel. Loud, fast music typically gives us energy. Calm, slow, soothing music typically calms us down. We usually wouldn't listen to music that we listen to when we work out or when we're partying, when we're trying to fall asleep or meditate. And for most of us. And so that is no different for the feelings that we have on our skin and the feelings that happen and the rhythms that happen inside of our body. Our body tries to match the rhythms that come from the environment. So by, pro by providing these vibration patterns to the skin, what it does is it sends signals to the brain that the brain instantly recognizes just like human touch and says, if I'm safe enough to take the time to pay attention to this feeling on my skin, then I'm clearly not running from a lion right now. And I can take a moment of pause, just like a deep breath, to reconsider how I'm going to approach the situation I'm in right now and to be present and calm and clear in this moment. Um, and that's effectively how Apollo works and what all of our work has been focused on, which is um, this stress response pathway and how to tap into it using everything that we've learned about neuroscience and technology. That's awesome, Dave. I think that that brings us to um, a, a new point, which is, you know, there are a lot of things that are restorative, right? So sleep's restorative, meditation, 
can train our, our nervous system. Um, you know, even taking some meditative, uh, you know, walks uh, can restore our nervous system. But when we think about a lot of these things, we think about them as calm, as calming, right? And the real, I think, benefit of Apollo to a lot of people is you can use it and really part of your work was to build this such that it wouldn't be just a tool that you use when you're trying to relax at home. It can be used for that, but it can also be used in all these other moments when it's not necessarily practical to start meditating or deep breathing and you can't go get a massage in the middle of a meeting or when right. your kids are you in the back of the a, car. And you can't always have a therapist with you to calm right. down and so, out. Right, and so I think one of the things that we uh, hear a lot about is how do these modes work? And so how do these modes work and how can, for instance, one mode help you transition to sleep and another mode help you focus? And how are those both increasing recovery, increasing heart rate variability, improving your resilience to stress? And so I think one of the really important things to talk about that we get a lot of questions about is how to best use the Apollo for sleep. And so when we are using it for sleep, should we be using it how best do we use the sleep mode? And are there other modes that we should be using throughout the day that can also help us with our sleep at night? Absolutely. So, um, and I'll just quickly answer a couple of really great questions that are coming in uh, that are related to this. So as we were just talking about, Apollo does tone the vagus nerve system, which is the primary nerve in the parasympathetic system. Um, and that we can tell that Apollo is working, I think most importantly by feeling and being aware of our bodies. But if we wanna measure it, you can measure it with heart rate variability measurement tools like an EKG machine, which is the gold standard. Difficult for us to use at home, but we can also do it with like a polar chest strap. Um, I think the important thing to note is that heart rate variability, which is one of the most, one of the most wonderful biomarkers we've had for measuring chronic stress um, is something that is difficult to measure at home. It's typically measured in a lab. Um, so, we have to, the only, so wearables are great to measure it, but they have to be trended over time. They're not good for point of use uh, measurement. You have to get a baseline when we're resting and then you have to get another measurement. Right, but I'm not time. talking about anybody. There's a lot of uh, our users who measure their heart rate variability and are very attuned to tracking right. things, but that's not everyone. A lot right. of people are just using this to help them fall asleep exactly. and they want to know how best to use it. So let's say I uh, have a really hard time falling asleep, but I sleep throughout the night. How would I use it versus somebody who wakes up frequently throughout the night? So there's so that's so that's a great uh, segue. So there's a lot of reasons why we have trouble falling asleep at night. Um, usually, it's because of things we're surrounded by in our environment that increase our level of stress. It could be screens. It could be um, too much activity or too many responsibilities that we have to focus on. Uh, all the way through drinking or to using stimulants in the afternoon or earlier in the day. Um, a really interesting study came out a couple of years ago that showed that roughly 80% of people who use a stimulant in the morning or so early in the day, like coffee, as an example, or black tea, um, will take a sedative at night like alcohol or a sleeping pill. And that is, uh, you know, showing that we're kind of on the Elvis diet, right? We're kind of like boosting ourselves up because we're too tired and we're not recovering enough at night. And then we're having to take something to calm ourselves down in the, in the evening or um, at night, and then we're not getting enough rest, and we enter, start entering this vicious cycle of impairing our recovery by using things that, like alcohol or sleeping medicine that don't actually allow us to get restful sleep. So the way that Apollo works in the best way for sleep is really to start to substitute for some of these things. So um, by, and helps to regulate circadian rhythms naturally by just sending signals to the body like melatonin. We know that when the sun sets, your melatonin starts to go up and it peaks right, uh, right around maybe like an hour or so after sunset um, to start. And that's supposed to be a signal to us that we're winding down, getting ready for bed um, and getting ready to enter a peak recovery state. But when we're surrounded by screens and blue light and all these other activities and things, that directly decreases our body's ability to make melatonin the way that it normally does in response to the environment. And so Apollo kind of helps to remind our bodies of how to do that. So if people have trouble going to sleep and falling asleep, the best thing to do is to use the relax uh, and unwind frequency uh, mode, which is uh, can be used for usually I would say um, most people somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes in that hour or two before bed when we're winding down to get ready for sleep. 
Um, can use it a little longer if you'd like. Um, the relaxing on wine mode is really effective at helping us transition into deep relaxation it space. It helps us move from wired to tired. Exactly. That's a great way to describe it. Um, and the other mode that also helps with that is the meditation and mindfulness mode, which is also great for chronic pain. Um, and so if you use one of these two modes when you're winding down before bed, um, that really helps transition the body from a really wakeful, sort of amped up energetic state into a much calmer state that's kind of ready for bed, sort of like a melatonin boost. And then um, when you actually get into bed, if you turn on the sleep and renew mode for, you know, for the average person, I would say 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes um, is enough. Um, if people tend to fall asleep or have trouble falling asleep, and then they also wake up soon after falling asleep, using it on the 60 minute or the 120 minute mode um, is really effective for those people. Um, and then there's also the buttons, which are really nice so that when you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't actually need to go back to your phone. Um, you can just press the buttons on the wearable, both buttons. If you press them for a half second at the same time, it'll restart the last setting you were on. So if you're somebody who has trouble falling asleep, but also wakes up in the middle of the night, you can set the wearable to uh, 30 minutes or 60 minutes. It doesn't need to be at the highest intensity. It just needs to be just barely felt. Um, the intensity doesn't need to be maxed out by any means. Um, and when you turn it on, um, it will run its course and you just need to notice that it's there. And, um, and then if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can press the buttons and it will turn back on and restart the cycle for you. So I guess what I'm hearing from, from users about sleep is they're wondering, and I think you touched on it, how long should I be using a program for? Should I diversify the programs that I'm using throughout the day? And then intensities, how intensely does this need to be used? Um, and I think you touched on it. And then that also speaks to battery life, right? So how long can I expect this to be active? How long should I be wearing it? And so what we know about sleep is that the sleep programs is that the sleep program is really designed to help you move and the relax and unwind to a certain extent are really parasympathetically tone boosting, right? They're designed to help really ease your body into sleep and to increase that recovery state right, to make it easier to fall asleep. Because for a lot of people that have a lot of stress and things going on in their lives, you know, you you have that churn of thoughts, right, that's hard to turn off. Um, and while everyone tells you to meditate and deep breathe, sometimes it's really hard, especially when you're stressed, because you're literally getting signals from your body. They're like, you're not supposed to be sleeping. Right. You're supposed to be answering emails or taking care of some problem, right? You're not supposed to be resting. But we know that in order to be able to take care of those problems, we need to rest. And then we get frustrated. And so with the Apollo programs, I think what you're, I heard you say is that for people who just have a hard time falling asleep, that they should use the shortest program possible, mm -hmm. and that the longer programs are really for people that have a really hard time falling asleep, or it could take them a very long time, or they wake up right after they fall asleep. Right. Um, but otherwise, they should be using the shorter programs, the least amount that they need, and then intensity-wise, a lot of people, you know, it, they may want to turn the Apollo all the way up. You don't necessarily recommend that, right? Right. So I think from our, that was a really good point. I think from our, our clinical trials and from our thousands of case studies, what we've learned from our users is that with Apollo, interestingly enough, less is more. So that goes for the amount of time that you use it and also the intensity level. Um, the body just needs, we just need to be aware that it's there, that the feeling is there. And when we're aware the feeling is there, that's enough for our body to get the benefits from it. And even if it fades into the background, that's okay. The body will still notice that it's there and it will help sort of keep us aligned and in balance. And if you feel that you need to turn it up a little bit over time, that's also fine. Um, but it's always better to, as we say in medicine, start low, go slow. Um, and that's no different with Apollo. Um, I think it's especially important with Apollo because Apollo is sound right? It's sound waves that activate the nervous system in the body in a very reliable way like music. And we all know with music, you wouldn't start listening to a song by jacking your stereo up to 100%. percent you blow your eardrums out and everybody would hate you. So that is no different with Apollo. And I think if we treat it like, uh, like the way we treat sound um, from, an under, from an understanding perspective of how we use it, that really serves as a great guide for how it helps us. And 
again, as you said, you know, the most important thing about, I think what people really love about Apollo is that it's there for them when they need it, but we don't need it all the time. In our clinical trials, particularly the uh, cognitive enhancement double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial at the University of Pittsburgh, we found the results of increasing heart rate variability happened within three minutes under stress. That is pretty incredible. That is no different than human touch or deep breathing. With uh, biofeedback, the heart rate variability shifts that are, that are the most major occur within 90 seconds in 95% of people. So that is really fast. And what that means is that if you can get the effects of Apollo for athletic recovery using the rebuild and recover setting post-workout for five minutes, or using the sleep setting for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, or any of the settings for a lesser amount of time, that effect not only takes hold for most people within five to 10 minutes with Apollo, but it actually lasts afterwards for most people for about 30 minutes to two hours after just 15 minutes of use. So, we, so I think the common misconception with these kinds of tools is you need more and you need a lot to get the effects you want, but this is actually very much the opposite. And this is something that we're learning more and more in medicine as we go, that not all things, the therapies that we use should be maxed out. Um, and so it's always good to start slow and sort of ease the body into these things, but you should be able to notice it and feel it. It shouldn't be distracting and it, and you shouldn't need to max it out. So you, when you talk about the sensory threshold, that's what you mean. Yes. Really where you can feel it and notice it, but not so that it's overwhelming or distracting. Right. Right. That right. makes a lot of sense. I think. And, yeah. yeah. And particularly on the focus mode, I think we got into this a little earlier, you know, if you use caffeine in the morning or in the afternoon because you're feeling uh, sluggish or tired, that is going to directly impair our ability to sleep. We, we know this. This is well documented in science um, for probably 50 years. So what we actually do and what all, many, many Apollo users do is instead of having that cup of caffeine or that stimulant, um, we'll say, we'll just turn on the Apollo onto clear and focus mode for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. And that, and, and I, my personal favorite intensity with clear and focus is like 20%. Mm -hmm. And that is more than enough to literally replace the effect of coffee without the jitters. And then I use that and I can stay in a deep focus flow state for usually one to two hours with just 15 to 30 minutes of the clear and focus setting. And that's the same for all the settings, just depending on what your goal is. Each setting is built around boosting heart rate variability and establishing balance in the nervous system. And it's just about matching the setting with your goal. That's awesome, Dave. I think the uh, other thing to talk about <clears throat> here is nervous system training. So when people talk about these modes and how to use them best, um, you know, for instance, there's the clear and focused mode, there's the meditation mode, there's the recovery mode, there's sleep, how, which ones should I use and how? I think one of the things that's really interesting is that people often go, I have trouble with sleep, so I'm going to use a sleep program. Mm -hmm. But then may, and they're like, I don't have any problem focusing. I'm a laser focused person, right? And then there's people who say, I fall asleep very easily, um, but maybe I'm distracted. And so I think what's interesting when we think about um, taking breaks, and recovery throughout the day is that using Apollo for a purpose with an intention throughout the day to help you work through whatever that challenge might be, actually using the focus program in the middle of the day or using the wake up program in the morning instead of drinking coffee or instead of doing something else that disrupts our circadian balance and actually makes it harder to recover, right? Drinking alcohol at night to sleep or uh, it decreases your recovery. Uh, drinking too much caffeine can make it harder for you to unwind. So I think what you're mentioning here is that if you're looking to improve your sleep, you may also want to consider using some of the other programs like the clear and focus mode or the meditation mode during the day to right. actually give yourself recovery because that will decrease your stress load and therefore make it decrease your need for stimulants, sure, or alcohol, sure, but it also will actually give you recovery throughout the day, which makes it easier to unwind at night. That, exactly. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Great. So For example, if you could recover a little bit while answering your emails, why wouldn't you want to, right? If you could right. recover a little bit um, when you're hanging out with your kids, why wouldn't you want to? So that's what Apollo kind of helps doing, which is the same thing that breath work does. Awesome. So I think there's two other questions that we got um, before we move to the questions from the panelists. So two of the key questions that we've been getting are about modes um, besides the intensity patterns, which we've now talked about, is 
uh, recovery mode and meditation mode. So for a lot of people, when we think about use cases about how to use the Apollo, people think the meditation mode is only for meditating. Right. And they think the recovery mode is only for recovering from an injury or recovering from maybe like an athletic event. And I wanted to ask you, um, how would you describe how to use those modes throughout the day, um, whether you're an athlete or a meditator or not? Right. And I think it's important to, you know, when we're talking about, you know, peak performance, peak performance is intense cognitive performance or mental or physical performance. It's not one or the other. So when you're intensely emotionally, physically, or mentally stressed out, the rebuild and recover mode has been shown in a number of trials at the University of Pilot, a pilot at the University of Minnesota with elite athletes, and another at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, these modes rapidly restore homeostasis and balance in the body um, by bringing heart rate down more quickly after intense stress, bringing blood pressure down more quickly after intense stress, and also resulting in increased performance on the next set. In, of, of whatever, this was specifically with athletics, that people who use the Apollo on recovery, the recovery mode for two minutes in between sets performed better on the, set, on the subsequent sets after using it. Um, and they saw that their performance was related to the amount their heart rate variability went up. So all of these things are connected and that whether you're um, having a very intense stressful day or a moment uh, that's mental or physical or emotional, Turning on the rest and uh, the rebuild and recover mode, even for five minutes, will help to rapidly restore the body and bring the nervous system back into balance. And I think that's one of the most uh, fun ways to use Apollo because that's when you, we, I personally, I feel it almost instantly and I really notice the effects very quickly. And many of our athlete, uh, athletes who use it um, also report that as well, which is really exciting. Um, and you can measure it, right? And so I think the meditation mode is, is also extremely interesting. When we started working with this mode, we called it calm flow because it's kind of like clear and focused, but it's much more um, centered in the body. It's much more relaxing than clear and focused. Um, it doesn't make most people sleepy, but it does um, help you to enter a calm, clear state. Um, and that state happens to help increase access to meditative states. It also does a lot of other things. Um, and most of these modes that you'll find uh, are actually have purposes more than just what they say on the app. It's hard to include everything. And we've learned a lot from our users. As an example, meditation and mindfulness mode is one of the best modes for pain, particularly chronic pain and digestion issues. And we've seen- Why is that? Why is that? Yeah. So I think the reason is because when we are in pain, chronically over time, this entrains these pain pathways in our body and our brain where we get used to stress, increasing inflammation in our body, and that automatically increases signals in that trained pain pathway. Um, and when we become dependent on things like medicine from the outside to numb us to that pathway, that pathway, we, don't, we, we get numb instead of building tolerance to that pathway. And effectively, if we can train our bodies to restore recovery and balance by vagal training. You can minimize the symptom. Right, you can, you right. can minimize the symptom by building tolerance to it within the system. So for me, recovery mode, I certainly use recovery mode after I work out, but I also use recovery mode anytime I feel run down. So if, if I'm feeling strained, like I need to bounce back. Okay. Off a plane. Um, yeah, I'm getting off of a plane or, you know, whenever we get to travel again, uh, or, you know, I am feeling like I'm getting a cold or kind of getting strained. I'll use recovery mode because it increases energy and also improves heart rate variability. Um, and the other thing with meditation mode, I'll use meditation mode personally, anytime I need to feel like I've meditated, even when I don't have the opportunity to do so. So for instance, um, giving an interview or walking into a stressful meeting or dealing with if I feel like I need to go do a meditation, I don't have time to, it gives me the benefit without necessarily needing to leave my day-to-day -day life because it's not always possible. So we have gotten a ton of questions. Uh, and we really appreciate that. And we really Thank you appreciate in. that. We so we're going to go, them eventually. we're going through, going to go through a bunch of these. So um, one major question that we're getting about uh, is just upcoming features uh, and things that we're working on. So one of the key features that we're working on right now um, that we're planning for a summer release is scheduling. So when we start talking about the best ways to use Apollo, 
um, whether that's for sleep or for focus and these different protocols, one of the things we're building in is a scheduling feature. Um, and what that will allow uh, you guys to do is essentially set when different programs will happen throughout the day. So for instance, going to sleep with a specific program and then all, you know, going to sleep with a sleep program, let's say you set that you go to bed at 10 o'clock and it sends you a notification and will turn on at 10 o'clock to help you ease into sleep. And also possibly in your schedule, you wanna wake up with the Apollo instead of using an alarm clock. Um, or you know you have a slump at two in the afternoon like most of us do and then the focus program starts. And so you can really customize how to use Apollo throughout your day and have it be an automatic feature. Um, in addition, some of the other things people are asking us about is really how to use Apollo when they're, um, when they're sleeping, uh, such that it doesn't disturb their sleep. So one of the key features of Apollo that we were talking about earlier is the use of the buttons. So you can see them on my device. Um, so with the buttons, um, for a lot of people, going to sleep might be a challenge, but a lot of us wake up in the middle of the night. And so one way you can use the Apollo to help you go back to sleep in the middle of the night without um, needing to like look at your phone is if you set the sleep program before you go to sleep and you press and it goes off, right? You say you use it for, for 30 minutes, you fall asleep and then it's two or three in the morning and you wake up. You can just press the two buttons on the device at the same time and uh, the program will start again. You can also control the intensity from the device, the ones with the little nub increases the intensity and the one, the button that is smooth decreases the intensity. So you can turn it up and down to really get it locked in um, to where you like it. Uh, and we purposely built that in because we don't want people to have to go back to their phones every time they want to use Apollo. The whole point is that, you know, you set it and then you can literally activate it and deactivate it and control most of what you need from the wearable itself. Um, so I think that's, that, that makes a huge difference when you start when you remember how to use the buttons and use it that way. Um, and it also has airplane mode for those who are sensitive to EMF. Um, you can set the Apollo to a setting that you like and then turn on airplane mode and the buttons will still work and you can still use the wearable without any connection to your phone at all and without any Bluetooth or signals being turned on. Another question that we get is location. So for instance, right now I'm wearing it on my wrist. Some people wear it on my ankle. Dave has it on his ankle, you can't see it. And then some people will ask us, okay, well, you know, does it matter where I have it? Why is it, does it work in two places? And does it work in, is there another part of the body that it would be more effective on? And I think that that uh, ties into how Apollo really works with the central nervous system. So I was wondering if you want to touch a little bit on where to wear Apollo and, sure. and why. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it actually taps into something else someone else asked about, which is what is the exact pathway of Apollo? Um, we don't have one exact pathway because there's actually not one pathway known for human touch. So human touch is known to activate the nervous system in the same way we've been talking about through the safety pathway through the skin, you activating the touch receptors and the touch receptors activate the vagal system. They activate the endogenous opioid system, the, the endorphin system, the endocannabinoid system, which is the system that makes our own cannabinoids in our body that helps improve emotion regulation, attention, calm, um, in, decrease inflammation, etc. All of these systems are activated by human touch that is soothing, gentle human touch. And all of these systems also seem to be activated by Apollo in the same way when we measure them in our studies. So we can't measure all of these systems all the time, but in the most comprehensive lab studies that we can do, which are extremely rigorous, um, that are not just done by us, they're done by others as well, we see that the same signature of, of uh, what we call the physiological signature, how the body changes in response to touch, is the same way that the body appears to change in response to Apollo. So why does that matter? That matters because Apollo actually works anywhere on the body. So if, if Apollo only worked on certain areas of the body, then this whole theory of touch would be a little bit confusing. But what we've actually found is that you can wear it anywhere because it seems to be activating the touch receptors in the skin. And we have touch receptors literally on every single part but of our skin. We picked the wrist and the ankle because one, they're easier to put it on than let's say your chest or the back of your head or on your head. Um, but the other reason for it is because they're dense bones. So mm -hmm. if you think about how vibration resonates, right? When you listen to a music that has, you know, a bass in it or um, a drum in it, um, when you feel that by frequencies and they transmit through dense material. So if you put it on your wrist or your ankle bone, 
you'll feel it because it's on a bone. Mm -hmm. And so it transmits and that's how you feel it. And one of the questions we got that I think is really interesting is people notice that when they wear the Apollo, particularly when they wear it on the low uh, intensity, right, like right where they notice it, after a little while, it fades into the background. And so one of the questions is, should we turn it up when you stop feeling it? And my answer to that question is no, you shouldn't turn it up. The programs are designed to help transition your body. Apollo is really a tool because for a lot of us, when we're strained, your body doesn't have the recovery. And when you don't have the recovery, you don't have the ability to control attention or slow your thoughts, not because it's your fault, but literally because your nervous system is screaming at you that you should be running away from a bear, <laughs> that there's a threat that you need to attend to, which makes it really hard to focus on something that isn't a threat, right? Or to calm yourself down. And so when Apollo fades into the background, what you're actually experiencing is that Apollo worked. Apollo, when you adjust to Apollo, it means it's bringing you up to baseline. One of the things we learned in the study is that for the people who have the lowest HRV, meaning they are the most strained, what we see is that they have the biggest improvement right? Meaning what Apollo is doing is it's helping to bring you back to a recovery state, to bring you back to your homeostasis. And so when you use Apollo, you're bringing yourself back into a balanced state. So when you feel that it's faded into the background, you're good. You, it's faded into the background and you have gotten the benefit. The purpose of continuing to use it is that it's pleasant and that it continues to allow you to stay in that state. So for instance, longer programs, for instance, for the focus program, if you know that you need to focus for hours at a time on something, and it's not just switching yourself into work mode, then a longer program might work well for you because it keeps you in that state. And really when you begin to notice it again, it's really a signal that your mind has wandered, that you're starting to get stressed out again, and then that kind of signals you back into the state. But when it fades into the background, it actually means that it works. Your HRV should be going up, you should feel more relaxed, and you're not paying attention to it anymore because you're paying attention to the thing that you're trying to do, whether that's focusing on work, meditating, or sleeping, or relaxing, whatever it may be. Um, so I thought that was a really fascinating question. Um, some additional ones um, on the roadmap. Uh, so another question that we've been getting uh, around sleep and use during sleep is dark mode. Um, we are working on dark mode in the app. Um, that said, like we discussed at night, you do if you set your Apollo in advance and when scheduling comes out, when you schedule your Apollo to turn on in advance, um, you won't need to be looking at the app and you can re-engage it with both buttons. Um, and that allows you, and there's also the airplane mode um, option, so that you do not necessarily need to engage with your phone at night because we were very cognizant when we developed it that we don't want people looking at their screens late at night because it disrupts sleep and circadian balances. Um, and then additional questions. Were there other questions that you wanted to answer, Dave, that were really important to talk about? Oh, maybe maximizing battery life. Yeah. So what to expect from battery life? How to use the modes to maximize battery life? So one of the key ways to drain the Apollo very rapidly, in general, you should be seeing about six to eight hours of runtime. Um, and so as people use it, people should be using it uh, with an intention, right? If you have a goal in mind, I need to focus or I need to sleep or I want to recover in some way, you know what your goal is, you set the program and it runs. And you don't need the longest program or the max intensity to get that, right? You should really be able to uh, get the effects fairly rapidly. Um, so one thing I've noticed um, when we look at usage is that when you turn the Apollo up to max intensity, um, which is understandable. People may, be, may think, oh, if I turn it up more, I'll get more effect. Um, but if you turn it up all the way, you will reduce battery life. So one of the key ways to actually preserve battery life is to put the intensity at, uh, right at where you notice it. Um, and that will give you the effect that you want, but also maintain the battery life. Um, and of course, the team is always working on firmware and software updates to maximize battery life. Um, are there additional questions you wanted to answer, Dave? Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some interesting things that we can talk about. So we have a lot of users who have chronic, um, chronic pain that are not just from nerve pain. People who typically have nerve pain, chronic nerve pain, digestive issues, things like that, that use this, um, they tend to get the best effects from the meditation and mindfulness mode, which I think a lot of people don't realize because it's really hard to describe that in a little blurb on the app. 
um, but we will be including more information on these for everyone. Um, so that's a really, really great one that I think most of us don't realize we could use a lot of the time and it's extremely helpful. Um, the, uh, we've actually seen people in preliminary results from our studies that are able to taper off of opioid medicines and benzodiazepines um, using these, uh, this particular frequency. We also have uh, people using the clear and focus setting for migraines and nausea or um, motion sickness. So headaches are really, really common with stress. All of us know that. We don't always think about it as related to stress, but whether it's a migraine headache, uh, a regular just achy head or a tension headache or a cluster headache, all of these kinds of headaches all get worse with stress. Um, and so people have been using Apollo, particularly if you've had a brain, a head injury, people, many people use Apollo on the clear and focus setting at a low intensity. Um, and it's incredi been incredibly effective at reducing migraine and headache symptoms over time um, and also reducing the symptoms of nausea or dizziness because um, increased stress and sympathetic activity in the fight or flight system all worsens these symptoms. So if we temper and improve balance by boosting recovery, we can combat that a bit. Again, the same effect you get by have, being a breathwork master, but without all the years of training to get there. So I've gotten two interesting ones um that people have asked uh, one is if you are somebody who is more prone to anxiety throughout the day um is there a particular recommended way to use it um so do you want to cover that yeah so during the day if you are prone to anxiety there's usually certain things that will typically make make us more anxious um assuming we don't have any idea what those things might be as a starting point um, the best way to use Apollo during the day would be to use it, to set it in the morning on clear and focused at a low intensity where you just barely feel it or on uh, social and open at a low intensity where you can just barely feel it, but you know, it's there and just set it on, you know, one of those settings for half an hour or an hour, uh, duration, and then just let it go. And then when it runs out, the effect should last for usually an hour, sometimes two, um, and then you can press the buttons at the same time for just a half second together, and that will activate it on the same setting that will help um, give you a boost throughout the day whenever you need it without having to go back to your phone. Um, usually those two frequencies in particular, the social and open and the clear and focus, are the best for anxiety uh, management during the day, whether that's tackling a specific right. phobia you're afraid of or whether it's generalized anxiety or, or it's just being able to focus or just being day. able to focus because you're overwhelmed or even things like OCD. Um, all of these different things uh, tend to be helped by, or at least people report help with these, uh, using these settings. So I think one of the things that's really interesting about that question is the way to use the Apollo during the day for different things. So I think when you think about the, the range of these modes, so social and open, clear and focused, or build and recover, those are all recovery programs. They're all intended to help you feel calm, but they're calm plus energy. And so what's really important about how to use the Apollo is to use the program for the, in line with the intention of the task. So just like you wouldn't drink a cup of coffee right before you wanna go to bed. I mean, some people do that for naps, but <laughs> I'm just saying in general, like you don't want to drink a whole, like a, two glasses of red wine first thing in the morning if you want to focus on your work that day because it's going to not have that effect. Um, the real thing to understand is all of the Apollo modes are designed to help boost up parasympathetic tone and increase recovery. But the ones that, uh, that do so during the day are more in line with your goals. So social and open, clear and focused, rebuild and recover, those modes are really designed to help you bounce back from stress and be able to recover uh, and focus and have energy. Whereas the ones like meditation, relax and unwind and sleep are also designed for recovery, but they're suited to help you wind down. They're more for use when you're trying to be calm or we're trying to wind down before bed. Um, and so I think for a lot of people, who might have stress or anxiety throughout the day, they nat naturally just press relax and unwind. And that's okay if you really want to calm down and lower your energy level, that makes sense. But if you're trying to calm down so that you can focus your attention, be productive, 
socialize and, and have conversations with people, the ones in the earlier part of the app are actually more energizing while remaining calm. And so I think that's a common theme that we get with patients, uh, with people who are otherwise healthy, who are just looking to boost their HRV, how best to use it. Feeling tired, Feeling like tired. you have to work or have to go out, have responsibilities, et cetera. Um, I think, again, somebody asked, people asking questions about where to wear it, how to wear it. I think really, really important to know is that it just should be comfortable on your body. Right. Um, One key question though that we got is where to wear it on the ankle. Yeah. So I can show you. Can show you <laughs> yeah. So with the wrist, <laughs> underside of the wrist is great or outer. That's really easy to understand. That's just kind of like a watch. I took my shoe off here. Oh my God. <laughs> there you go. There. Everyone, this I'm is where you wear it. It can be on the inside <laughs> and the outside of the ankle. Um, buttons always down. And it doesn't need to be right on the bone, which we call the malleolus, but it can be if you want it to be. Inside or outside doesn't matter, it's personal preference. Um, but the main thing is it just is snug and not tight, not squeezing you. So the point is, um, comfortable. we wouldn't put it on the back of your Achilles ankle or on the front of your ankle. It should be on the inside of the bone or on the outside of the bone. And the reason for that is so that it is contact with the bone so that it resonates. If you put it on the soft tissue, you're just gonna irritate your ankle. Um, and the other thing is, I in particular will wear it on the outside of my ankle when I sleep. And that's because when my legs move throughout the night, if I wear it on the inside, I can rub against my other leg. And so if I put it on the outside of my ankle, it works very well for not interrupting my sleep. Um, but again, the most important thing is it does work anywhere on the body. So the best thing that you can do for yourself is to make sure that it's, <laughs> that it's <laughs> That it's comfortable. People really liked your foot. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. Um, but yeah, the best thing that you can do is make sure that it's comfortable. You yeah. know, we designed the Apollo to be comfortable and to kind of feel like a ring of vibration around right. your limb, your ankle, or your wrist, because that's how it gets the best effect and also uses the least amount of energy to get that effect. So that will help your battery life last longer if you wear it comfortably and snugly um, without any kind of you know discomfort. Mm -hmm. If it feels strange just give it a little adjustment or wiggle it so that it feels comfortable and soft. And most people who wear it regularly, I would say probably everyone who wears it the way that we recommend, um, where it's comfortable, basically the feeling of it totally fades into the background as it should, and it's not something they're paying attention to on a regular basis. So we got another good question, which is around the ages of people and who, who can use Apollo. And so I think one of the really important things to understand is when we are, were originally working on this technology at the university, we were purposefully working with touch because it's one, uh, a tool that we don't often get to use in real time. And uh, two, because it's extraordinarily safe. And so for a lot of people, particularly people who might have a chronic illness, um, they may not want to take medication, they want to take less medication, or in some instances, medication isn't, uh, you know, the first choice um, because of potential for addiction and dependence um, or because of negative side effects. Um, and so we really designed Apollo to be useful for vulnerable populations. And so we have had the whole gamut, if you look at our range of users, we have children all the way up to the elderly. Three to 93. Right, three to 93 using this device. And so one of the questions is, can it be used with kids? And the truth, uh, the answer to that question is yes, and we've had really incredible results with kids. Um, we just ran a pilot uh, trial um, with a uh, clinic for children with developmental disorder um, in Allentown, um, which we have posted to our website and we'll be um, doing more information about with kids who have ADHD, anxiety, um, and, and, autism. and autism. And what we found is that we had 14 out of the 15 kids that ran through the pilot had an over 50% reduction in their anxiety scores. We saw in just a few minutes. Of use. Right. And we saw improved reports of behavior, not only from the patients, but also from the caregivers and uh, teachers and therapists that the children were having a much easier time with focus, with emotion regulation, with um, attention control. Um, and so that clinic will be evaluating Apollo as a first line to reduce the amount of Adderall that children need to be prescribed. Of all, I mean, of all medicines that are used to control behavior in children, right. which is a last resort, 
for children. And the only reason we prescribe medication to control behavior in children is because we literally have given up. Uh, we don't have anything else left to, to do right. in medicine. This is something that can be used as a first but, line to help reduce the need for those medicines. But the idea is, is Apollo safe for kids? Absolutely, even in vulnerable populations. We've also had um, and have no indication that pregnant women can't use Apollo, motion sickness, anxiety, trouble sleeping. These are all things that pregnant women face. Uh, there are no known side effects. Nausea. Nausea. There are no known side effects from Apollo um, and can be a really great tool for people who cannot otherwise use another tool like medicine because they are pregnant. Um, and we've also seen elderly people use Apollo um, to reduce the amount of medication that they need to take to help them fall back asleep if they have sleep disturbances in the middle of the night. And so Apollo is definitely safe for all populations. Um, the only people we recommend not use it are children under three, and that's simply because of small parts, um, which is a choking hazard. Um, and then uh, in addition, we had um, some questions about, um, what it, is, what was this? Somebody said I should uh, restore my nail polish next time. Sorry, it, uh, it wore off and I've just been too busy. To pedicures, <laughs> pedicures necessary for Dr. Dave. Um, let's see what else is really interesting. So, will, some common ones. Common ones, yeah. And then, oh, and, yeah, an owner's manual. So, all, almost every single thing that we're talking about here is on the Apollo Neuro website. Right. I think if you go to the help uh, section, yeah, help section, there's tips and tricks about how to use Apollo to get the most out of your experience. Um, so a couple things, and, if you and, go to the science yeah. section on the page, so all this information about modes, how we designed them, the science behind them, how best to use them, that's all found on the science section of the website. Just scroll down to the bottom and you can get descriptions of all the modes. Um, if you're looking for how to use Apollo, where to wear Apollo, uh, when you get the Apollo, it actually has a user guide that talks about all of those features. Um, and then we also have a full help section on the website um, in our support that goes through uh, onboarding, best use cases. And in addition to that, we're actually developing a whole heck of a lot of content that we'll be sharing out about best use cases, information from our studies. So we're constantly going to be sharing that information with you guys and we really appreciate the questions. And if anyone, if you, and we really encourage you to go through the website because we're trying to do the best we can to provide as much information for all of you as possible and in a way that you can right. easily um, take and make actionable and we hope that it's useful. If you go through our website and you can't find what you're looking for, please send an email to support. Um, and we will make sure to work on that and get it included. Yep, and then the other thing, if you're looking at more information about this pediatric study that we just talked about, or the additional studies that we've done on PTSD, physician burnout, um, and Healthcare HR, workers. heart rate variability, et cetera, you can go on to our, our blog section of the site and literally every uh, write-up for every study uh, is in there and all of the literature references, understanding the mechanism and how this works, is also in there. Um, the one other question we got um, on healthcare conditions is PTSD and Apollo. So this is a very interesting subject. This is actually um, really where the research for Apollo began. Um, so for people with PTSD, they may experience a number of symptoms. One of the key ones is hypervigilance. So what's happened is this uh, either a chronic a series of or an acute stressor has occurred that causes someone to be in a higher sympathetic state and then also makes it much easier for someone to enter that sympathetic state. Um, so, and hypervigilance basically simply means just constantly never feeling safe. Right, surveying the scene for possible threat all the time. And that happens when someone has, you know, we see this with veterans, survivors of traumatic events, this happens a lot. And we also see common things that anybody who's stressed out gets, but can also, but are exacerbated in people with PTSD. So trouble focusing attention, the freeze response, getting overwhelmed and just freezing, and then also sleep disturbances, mm -hmm. um, are nightmares. At, nightmares and panic. Mm -hmm. And so what Apollo was actually designed for originally was to help people who were in a stressful situation, right? Particularly people with PTSD, sure, meditation, deep breathing, um, yoga, exercise, all of these restorative practices are really important. But in the moment that you're very stressed, they're really hard to do. So and so hard. having using Apollo as a touch pathway where someone had the extra control that they could 
just use this tool to help them transition into that state and then train their nervous system over time to make them more resilient was actually one of the core reasons we ended up developing Apollo. We have tested it in a number of people with PTSD, first responders, 9-11 uh, survivors and first responders in 9-11, uh, healthcare uh, practitioners who've had really uh, traumatic experiences in the field, and a lot um, of veterans. veterans and other survivors of traumatic experience. And what we've seen is that people with PTSD have generally very low HRV um, because of uh, what's going on in the nervous system. And so with people with PTSD, we actually see really big improvements in heart rate variability, uh, emotion regulation, um, feeling of calm and safety, and ability to regulate uh, mood, uh, focus, and sleep. And we um, are, the University of Pittsburgh is conducting a trial. You're right, Julia, it is an autonomic disorder. Thank you. There you go. Uh, it is a disorder of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and so one of the things, uh, the University of Pittsburgh is doing a trial uh, with um, people with uh, PTSD, and they've run 14 patients so far. And we, what we've seen is what we see consistently in our other studies and in the real world, uh, which is that people have an easier time falling asleep, better focus, and we see improved heart rate variability. Another question we, we got that I want to touch oh, on. Can I add something about the PTSD Absolutely. Real quick? So one thing I think that's really, really common that we forget about in PTSD is how important it is to get restful sleep. Um, and what happens in PTSD is we often have terrible nightmares that impairs the ability to get restful sleep and we to the point where we can even become afraid to allow ourselves to fall asleep one of the biggest benefits that apollo has had um, that our folks with children and adults with ptsd have told us we didn't know this uh, at first but that when people are using apollo on the sleep mode to sleep, uh, when they go to bed and the relaxing mode before that to wind down before bed that has an incredible effect on um, reducing and preventing nightmares and so we see people who've had nightmares for literally years um, wearing Apollo to sleep who are telling us that after just a, a few days of using it, they're getting the best sleep of their lives for no other reason that they can say other than the fact that they're not afraid to fall asleep anymore because they're not having nightmares. And I think that is really incredible because nightmares are a sign that our body's perceiving threat even when we're sleeping. So um, this is just a whole, a whole big part of this constellation of symptoms that we work on with PTSD where the body is known to be in a very high stress state continuously. And by using any technique that boosts safety, like Apollo, um, this helps retrain the safety system to be more active than the threat system um, to keep these systems in balance so that we can remember that sleep is a safe place for us. Sleep is a place that we need to prioritize and we need to not be afraid of. So, and we don't have, really have a reason to be afraid because when our body's calm, we sleep well. Um, and so just by nature of having nights like that, that start to happen more and more frequently with Apollo, the body learns to access these states of deep recovery more effectively on its own, which doesn't create a dependence on Apollo. It actually teaches the body, our bodies, how to enter recovery states more effectively and more reliably on a regular basis. So by no means is the technology habit forming in, the, in a negative way. It actually encourages our, the body, our bodies to train circadian rhythms, train our sleep and wake cycles, train ourselves to feel safe, which is actually a cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure technique that is the leading treatment for PTSD, which I was in a lot of ways doing with my patients, but it requires an enormous amount of effort. So Apollo was a way for us to give people something that they could take with them um, to get the same similar benefits to exposure therapy, but without having to have a therapist present with them. And it actually does seem to work that way. Um, so all of our results from the PTSD trials and the real world, as Catherine said, are all coming back consistently in this way. Awesome. So one of the other questions that we have been getting uh, mm -hmm. is around heart rate variability. So people trying to track uh, efficacy using uh, other wearables like aura rings uh, and polar straps and these other tools and there's an aura ring and how to tr you know track it. And then also we got an interesting one uh, from someone who has low HRV and is doing everything thing in their power, mm -hmm. it sounds like, to improve it, but isn't necessarily seeing huge jumps, right, uh, into HRV. And, you know, personally, uh, I know people who have HRV well in the 200s, and I know people who are relatively healthy people who have, you know, somewhere in the 40 to 60 range, um, and some people who can't get it above 40. And so I think one of the key things with data that we need to be careful about is that sometimes data just ends up giving us more anxiety. 
<laughs> because and surveys of people with with other wearables has shown this also right and so the thing is what are you actually paying attention to uh, and so there's two key things to understand here. One, um, when you're tracking measures of like particularly uh, heart rate variability, sleep latency, deep sleep, um, your resting heart rate, particularly with HRV, you want to be using a tool that samples your heart rate variability while you're at rest. So the thing is, if you're tracking HRV with a tool that's measuring your heart rate variability while you're moving around, it's going to be an inaccurate measure. So Apple Watch is great, but has some limitations into the accuracy of HRV because most people don't wear their, uh, their Apple Watch at night. Um, so something like an Aura Ring is great for trending HRV. The other thing to understand is point of use is really difficult with heart rate variability because literally if I stood up my HRV would change. When you change your breath pattern, your HRV, HRV changes. changes. When you think about work, your HRV changes. When we blink, our HRV changes. So literally all of these it's different dynamic. things, it it's, changes with our environment. It's variable. Right. It's in the name. It changes. And so the main thing to know about when you're tracking your HRV is maybe your baseline is lower than the average bear. There are a lot of things that do that. You know, For instance, drinking wine before bed, particularly red wine mm. before bed, will knock your HRV down. Alcohol is the most common way that we see people causing HRV drops that they don't understand. Alcohol. Alcohol. Most common. Yes. So sleep, good restful sleep, the most common way to boost your HRV reliably on a daily basis right. and see continuous improvement. So I think one of the key things to know is it's about consistency and it's about trending over time. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at your heart rate variability from an accurate tool, uh, you should be trying to trend it up over a period of time and really looking for changes, dramatic changes in your heart rate variability. So for instance, if you have a normal heart rate variability of 60 and all of a sudden one day it's 20, that's a big dip maybe, and you should pay attention to why that might have occurred. So um, did you get poor sleep? Are you starting to feel ill? Did you drink more than you usually do? And then you can tweak things that can improve your heart rate variability over time. So if you're looking at um, how does making sure you know that Apollo is working for you, I think um, a lot of the things we talked about, you know, like setting the intensity, where you can feel it, using it for an intention, but not distracting. Yeah, not shouldn't be distracting. Setting it for an intention, using it to help you transition to a specific state, whether that's focus or sleep and to help you balance your circadian rhythms and get that recovery so that you can get good and restful sleep. Um, so that over time, what you should see is that your heart rate variability will trend up. When we saw in the lab trials, people's HRV bounce up two to three times their average, what was really interesting under about stress. under stress, and that's using lab, super sensitive lab grade equipment, right? We're talking EKG, EEG, uh, respiratory you know, monitors that are separate from the EKG, right. sweat monitors, pupil monitoring, the works. The works in terms of lab grade, which is way more sensitive than a commercial grade consumer wearable. Um, what we saw and why that was so interesting is that normally under stress, your heart rate variability goes down, right? Because you're strained and that's normal. Um, so when you see HRV go up, when someone was cognitively stressed out, what that's showing is that we are able to help people recover in real time. And that's why Apollo can be so effective for helping you deal with stress is because it gives your body that recovery boost while you're dealing with something stressful, which means that it strains you less, you're better able to deal with it, and it causes less of a toll on you over time. So if you use the focus program during the day so that you can focus your attention, you should be less strained when it rolls around to eight o'clock at night. And that plus the sleep program will help you ease into sleep. And you can use this to really regulate your sleep cycles and basically give your body a little bit more recovery and boost so that you're better able to tackle whatever is before you, whether that's your kids or balancing work life or dealing with COVID um, or whatever it might be. It makes you, it helps you use a tool to make you more resilient. Right. And I think that that's a really important point is that Apollo is not by any means a magic button. There is no such thing as a magic button that just makes us better magically right then and there. Apollo is a change agent. So what it does is it's a tool, just like um, breath work or just like meditation, um, it's a tool that we can use in the moment to bring prime our nervous system in our bodies to be in a state that is accepting and ready to adapt and change 
to whatever comes at us next. That's that whole resilience bouncing back thing. Um, again, the intention of what you go into that experience with is really important. So you wouldn't use a wakeful setting when you're trying to fall asleep and you wouldn't use a sleepy setting when you're trying to wake up, just like with music. Um, but again, it's important to remember that that ability for Apollo to help us change is why when we use it, and Julia had a great point of mentioning this in the chat, um, is that how we use it specifically to improve our ability to adapt to changes in energy in our lives. So going from sleepiness to wakefulness, wakefulness to sleepiness, stress to meditation, meditation to deep focus work, all of these things are changes that can make us stressed out. So um, Apollo just helps smooth out that change. So uh, you, you want to talk about this one? I want to talk about... Um, we're Adaptogenic, yes. Thank you. I love that word. Um, do, you want, do you want to ask this, answer this question real quick? Can I do that? Sure, go ahead. We so, got a question about whether Apollo is safe to use in epilepsy. We also got a question about the use of Apollo in Parkinson's disease. And yeah. honestly, uh, in this chat, I thank you guys. We've gotten a zillion uh, specific questions about individual chronic uh, illnesses. So do you want to just touch on that as a theme in general? Yeah, yeah, I think, so we've done a lot of studies of Apollo and there's a lot more on the way that are conducted by research groups at the University of Pittsburgh and also at other universities around the country. Any, any study that we currently have preliminary results for, you will see on our website. There are about five other ongoing studies right now that are not listed because they're still, you know, in the process, of, in the works. And we wouldn't want to share anything with you until we have Data. confirmation of, real data from the research team that is doing the work. Um, so please be patient with us and all of this will continue to come out over time. Um, the, are, there are, we, I think it's really important to note that again, and tapping into something that Catherine said earlier, the reason why we focused Apollo technology on the touch receptor system and not using things like electricity or, or other things that have been used in, the, in history uh, for, inter for treatment and therapy is because touch is universally found to be safe and the frequencies that we use in Apollo at the intensity levels we use in Apollo. Even if you max it out. Even if you max <laughs> it out are known to be safe in the literature across the board. And so I think it's important to know that, um, you know, you can't really hurt yourself with this. That said, if you have a chronic illness like epilepsy or like Parkinson's or like uh, fibromyalgia or something of this nature where you already know that your body's extra sensitive to stress or extra sensitive to stimuli from the environment. Migraines are a great example, you know, where the light could change in a certain way or the loud sound could come on and that could trigger you into an episode. If you know you're one of those people that's already hypersensitive to things around you in the environment or stress, then you always want to be extra sure to start the Apollo extra low intensity and slowly and work very it gently ramp it up. Because when our bodies are in a hypersensitive state, I think the most common time that we see this is with traumatic brain injury, where the body gets into a hypersensitive state where any little thing can set us off into a headache or a stress response that could be very, very uncomfortable and disruptive. Um, and it could lead to something like epilepsy, um, or sorry, like a seizure or something like that from stress. Apollo is great at minimizing the stress response and seems to help people with these kinds of things, but the key is to keep that intensity low. For everyone, this is important, but particularly if you know that your body's sensitive, um, always start low and go slow, and then gradually, gently ramp up the intensity to get the need, the, to meet your needs. So I think the main thing to understand is that we built Apollo for vulnerable populations, and in general, uh, this range of frequencies can't hurt uh, and in and that and it's safe, you know, pretty much universally found to be safe. Um, and <clears throat> you know, if you have a condition that's worsened by stress, where the symptoms are worsened by stress, um, in general, increasing recovery, increasing parasympathetic tone through touch and deep work, uh, breath work, meditation, um, yoga, stretching, these kinds of things, uh, helps to uh, reduce inflammation um, and increase heart rate variability and thereby help you manage your own system uh, symptoms naturally and help reduce um, the, uh, the intensity of your symptoms. Um, and that's part of recovery in general. That said, we need, I am not a physician and Dave is not your physician. 
<laughs> so what's really important to note is that if you're concerned about introducing a new technology into your regimen, mm -hmm. we strongly recommend talking to your uh, practicing physician um, to get their guidance because they know you mm -hmm. um, personally and they know your symptom profile. Um, but in general, Apollo is safe, um, is a safe technology. And all we're, you know, when you really break it down, this is sound waves that you can feel, not hear. Um, and that's why, you know, and this isn't electricity and this isn't something that, um, that is, it's designed to be gentle. You know, part of this, should I feel it very intensely? No, you should just feel it. And then it should fade into the background because it's designed to be a natural feeling like deep breath. It's actually based on these resonance patterns in our bodies. Um, so it feels natural for a reason. It's because it's based on natural mechanism and it should feel gentle. It shouldn't feel like a jolt. It should feel gentle and you should be able to ease into it. It should feel like a nudge, not a jolt. Yes, exactly. Gentle nudge. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions. And I just want to just add on to that real quick. Last, last thing that could come from me is that, <laughs> though, because you brought up something really important. I am a doctor and I'm very well trained, but I am not your doctor. While we have seen many, many people using Apollo and having great success at reducing their own medication use, we do not recommend that you stop taking your medication as prescribed by your doctor uh, without talking to your doctor first. Uh, I think almost all doctors in general will agree that if we don't require medication to manage our symptoms, it's better not to use it. But that said, if we plan to try to come off of some of our medication or reduce our dosage, it should, be part of your care it should plan. always be part of your care plan with your personal doctor. So please, please, please make sure that if you want to decrease your medicine, um, similar to and try to achieve some of the results we've seen in our clinical trials, please talk to your doctor about getting on the same page with them about this plan. And they would, I'm, mo I'm sure they would be happy to work with you um, to try to do this. The less side effects that we all get from our medicines, the better, uh, the better for all of us. And so um, we've gotten a lot of questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. We've actually gone over more than a half an hour over and you guys, most of you have stuck with us, which is amazing. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. For your I time. wanted to leave this here. Um, any question that we didn't get a chance to answer, we're going to be going through all of them as a team. Uh, we're going to be doing more tutorial videos on how to use Apollo, going over a lot of these co this content in um, short segments. Um, and we'll be reviewing all the questions that didn't get answered and make sure that we create content to answer these questions. And we really appreciate you guys um, hanging in for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, we had gotten a couple questions about shipping uh, when we're back in stock. Um, and so uh, Apollo, uh, you know, things with COVID uh, slowed down production. Um, so, and we sent out communications about that, but we are planning to be back up and live uh, coming very shortly. Uh, in May, and we should be shipping in May. Um, we will be sending out a notification to anybody who back ordered, um, who's part of the back order on their, uh, in general, about when they can expect shipping notifications. And then anybody who did order will get a notification as soon as their unit ships. And we really appreciate you guys being patient and excited to use the product um, and hanging in with us during this crazy pandemic time. We really appreciate it. And for new orders, we will again begin shipping in May, um, very end of May, early June for new orders. Um, the thing about this is we sold out really fast last time. So if you put in your order now, uh, you'll, we will pri you will be prioritized in the order that we get the, the order. Uh, basically, we'll start shipping them out in the order we receive the, the orders. So um, that's that. And then somebody asked, is the app free? Yes. Um, for the app is free uh, with your purchase of the Apollo device and um, and then the upcoming features <clears throat> are scheduling to be released um, in the early summer and then uh, yeah just a couple of quick things to answer people's questions uh, last questions all the settings on Apollo all the modes are designed to increase heart rate oh yeah variability. we have one more question which is um, which ones are best used to improve heart rate variability all of them are designed to improve heart rate variability. The key and thing to understand is that basically from the top of the app, if you're looking at the programs, it's like energy, social clear and energy. social and open, clear and focused, recovery, mm -hmm. meditation, and then it goes down the line into relax and sleep. If you think about the nervous system, you're going from the most active and energetic to the least energetic, sleep being the calmest. And so if you're looking for um, high HRV, use any of the programs in clear and focused, 
in social and open in recovery mode during the day when you want to boost HRV, but also need energy, right. use the programs like meditation, relax and unwind and sleep when you're looking to relax, mm -hmm. calm down and also boost up your HRV, but in a way that is more a calming, unwinding and mm -hmm. less of an energetic feel. The only one that is slightly less HRV boosting but still has components of HRV boosting is the wake up program. The wake up program is specifically designed to get your blood pumping a little bit, to give you a little jolt of energy and using that instead of a stimulant, right? So if you are tired, groggy, you just really need some energy and you would normally go for a double shot of espresso mm -hmm. or a Red Bull or something else that'll exhaust your adrenals and then give you a crash, try the wake up. The one thing I would say with wake up is you do not need it very intense and you do not need to use it very long. It works really fast, mm -hmm. but all of the other programs are really designed to boost resilience, boost recovery. It's just the ones that are in the clear and focused recovery, social and open mode are really designed to help you have that HRV and recovery during the day when you also need to have energy. Right. And the other ones like the relax and unwind, the sleep and meditation are designed to boost HRV, but help you really unwind so that you can get restorative rest. And so that's really how we designed it. Right. And, and sort of recover, if you think about it in that way that Catherine just described, rebuild and recover mode kind of sits in the middle right. as, dev as of the most balanced, uh, even state. And then as you go up in the menu from rebuild and recover to clear and focus, social and wake, you increase wakefulness, which increases uh, energy levels. Um, so you're, not gonna, you're still going to get an HRV. You should expect to get an HRV boost. Um, as we found in our lab studies, but it's not going to be as great an HRV boost as you get when you go down from recovery, which is into the meditation and mindfulness mode, relax and recharge and sleep, which naturally boost the recovery response more. They are designed to boost the parasympathetic response more so that we're able to wind down and feel safe enough to fall asleep and do things like meditation, which are you know, really vulnerable states for us that we don't think about when we're meditating or sleeping our guards down. You got to feel safe. You got to feel safe well. to be able to really enter those states and allow ourselves to maximize recovery. I think just to leave you with one last thing on sleep, one of the great changes that we've seen from people with aura rings, a lot of people with aura rings are participating in our um, aura Apollo sleep study. And we really appreciate you for uh, sharing your data with us. Um, I personally have been tracking mine as well. And with my aura ring and one of the great things we see about aura is that it not only tracks hrv trends um, it tracks body temperature tracks resting heart rate it also tracks things like uh, which are not perfect measurements but it tracks things like deep sleep and rem sleep deep sleep and rem sleep are known to be some of the most restorative states of sleep for us and when we are stressed out or afraid or anxious those are the first parts of sleep to go so what's really fascinating about apollo is people will start to see very soon after using it, typically if they are tracking their deep sleep and their REM sleep increases in those particular metrics. Why? Because when we feel safe enough to allow ourselves to enter into a deep or REM sleep state where we're extremely vulnerable, people in REM, when we're in REM sleep, we oftentimes might not even be able to move because we're deep in a dream or deep in, uh, you know, we're not, we're not physically aware of our environment. So feeling safe is critical and that is a huge part of the theory for why Apollo is so effective at helping people enter these states more effectively. And we actually see it continue over time. As you start to use Apollo, you get these initial boosts. And then over time, as you continue to use it, people typically see continued improvements on sleep uh, for deep sleep, REM sleep, and also total sleep efficiency. Um, sometimes up to 50% improvement. Uh, people going from like one hour of REM and deep sleep to two hours over the course of a month, which is really incredible. Yeah, we're really excited. We really appreciate you guys uh, joining us. We were so excited that so many people uh, had so many questions and that we could provide this information to you guys. Um, and we will be sharing this webinar um, via email, a link. And we'll also be looking at any questions that we didn't get the chance to answer. We will be looking at to create more content uh, and look out for additional webinars where we can mm -hmm. really dig into details on studies that we were doing, best use cases. And as you guys send us questions and feedback, we are better able to uh, really help design uh, and make more improvements to the product over time, Deb, because our goal is really to create a powerful tool that empowers you guys to take control of your health and how you focus and your sleep and your heart rate variability, because all of us uh, have a lot of stress out there and being resilient to it is gonna be really important 
for getting through this uh, stressful time and then also managing our health over the long term. And we're just really excited to have the opportunity to serve you guys. So thanks so much for your time and thanks for being part of the webinar. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And please check out our blog and we have lots of great information on the blog and lots of great podcasts where we get into some really deep detail on this. Every podcast kind of has a different story about Apollo or a different way to use it or different techniques that you can use with or without Apollo to help yourself um, be more resilient, bounce back better and have more balance in your nervous system. Um, we really try to focus our content on things that you could do with and without the technology because all of this is important to this sort of ecosystem of health that we really need to focus on as a community um, for public health. You know, the healthier we are and the less likely we are to get sick, the less likely our family and our friends and our community are to get sick as well. So all of this is really important and you know we really hope you check that out. And if there's anything that you would like um, to see that you haven't seen, please shoot us let an us email know. and let us know. All right. Thanks guys. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.